Welcome from the Center for Economic Policy Research to another of our special COVID-19 webinars. My name is Tim Phillips. It has been called messianic, unclear, just nuts. And they're some of the kind of things that have been said by mainstream macroeconomists about modern monetary theory, MMT. Well, last week, Peter Bofinger of Würzburg University, he's a former member of the German Council of Economic Experts, published a column in Social Europe titled Coronavirus Crisis. Now is the hour of modern monetary theory. Could this crisis and the policy responses we're seeing to it provide the perfect natural experiment to test MMT's predictions? Well, Peter's here today to talk about the topic. Peter, welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the chance to discuss modern monetary theory in the context of the coronavirus crisis. So I will start to present a simple macroeconomic framework for analyzing the shock and for identifying how governments have to react to this shock. And then I will show how MMT fits in in dealing with this shock. So what we see now is the shutdown, uh, which is now become effective almost all over the world. And in economic terms, one can compare the shutdown to a kind of economic tsunami hitting the whole economic system. The first wave, it's the service and production sector, especially what we call social consumption. And in this sector, many payments are variable, wage payments, consumption, investment, all these variable payments are cut down. Then in a second wave, the tsunami will hit the real estate sector and the banks. In this sector, normally payments are fixed for a longer period of time. So it's rents, leases, interest and principal. And the problem is here that the companies in the service and production sector will be no longer able to make these payments in full. So if this continues, uh, then a third wave then could hit even investors and pension funds if banks are no, uh, no longer able to deal with bad loans. And so it could become a full-blown banking crisis. So of course, this is only a kind of scenario and it shows in my view, how important it is to stop this wave as fast as possible, especially in the sector of services and production and preventing uh, the wave from spreading to the real estate sector and also to uh, investors' pension funds. So this is the task that the governments are facing and the question is what has needs to be done? And I think this has been put in a very good way by Mario Draghi in an op-ed for the Financial Times the speed of the deterioration of private balance sheets caused by an economic shutdown that is both inevitable and desirable must be met by equal speed in deploying government balance sheets, mobilizing banks, and as Europeans, supporting each other in the pursuit of what is evidently a common cause. So the question is, where do the balance sheet effects of the crisis come from? And it's related to the chart I've already shown, the problem is we have sectors in the economy which receive variable payments that at the same time have to make fixed payments. And as I said, the first wave is private households in the service of manufacturing sectors where the payments contract, but at the same time, these sectors have still to make fixed payments for rents, for leases, for fixed interest in principle. And so this creates this, this balance sheet effects. Uh, that are extremely detrimental for the economy. And the question is now, how can the government deal with these balance sheet effects? How can he help to repair the balance sheets that are uh, very much damaged by this uh, kind of economic tsunami? And in order to show this, I have a very simple macroeconomic uh, balance sheet analysis with four sectors, private non-banks, financial sector, government, and the central bank. We have the pre-crisis situation, uh, and then uh, the crisis hits uh, the sectors, and of course it hits first the private non-banks and the financial sector. And uh, for the private non-banks, the crisis means that the balance sheet contracts and that at the same time debt increases. This additional debt will be financed in the first instance by the financial sector, and of course, as a consequence, also the debt of the financial sector goes up. If the government remains passive, we see the deterioration of balance sheets by private non-banks and by the financial sector. They both have a higher leverage. And of course, 
this deterioration of balance sheets uh, can lead to insolvencies. And in addition, uh, it's a huge burden uh, once uh, the shutdown is finished and the economy shall be restarted. So the idea of Mario Draghi that uh, the burden has to be taken out of private balance sheets to the government sector can be shown by the third line, where now the government is taking over at least a part uh, of the burden by making direct transfers to private non-banks. And the private transfers to non-banks reduce their debt. It also reduces the lending of the financial sector to the private sector. And now the debt is in the balance sheet of the government. And how does the government finance it? It finances it by issuing bonds, and the bonds are simply purchased by the central bank. This is, in a nutshell, the modern monetary theory idea to take out the debt from the private sector, put it on the government balance sheets, put it, so to say, in the public sector. And that's, in my view, the way to deal with it. And this direct financing of the additional government debt by the central bank, I think this is one of the core ideas uh, of modern monetary theory. So how does balance, balance sheet repair by governments function? Well, it, right now we observe that in most countries, governments are providing public guarantees uh, to the private sector. This is a kind of first line defense, which in my view is quite useful, but one has to be clear, this only helps to maintain cash flows of solvent companies. It does not repair balance sheets, and it's useless if a company is already insolvent. So balance sheet require, requires direct transfers from the government to the private sector. In Germany and many other countries, uh, we have now direct transfers to very small enterprises and of helicopter money for these for this companies. In Germany also, we have now a huge fund for the direct capitalization of large enterprises in the same way as banks were recapitalized in the financial crisis. But what is also needed are effective transfer for small and medium enterprises. And here, I think the only way to help them are negative taxes. You get some kind of rebate on the taxes that you've paid last year. And this, this is something that you can receive as, as a transfer. I think the really important thing to do is this kind of, of balance sheet repair. It will be costly for, for governments. It will require huge amounts of money. And the question is, can governments really finance it? And this now leads to the core idea of modern monetary theory. Where are the limitations for government financing? And uh, modern monetary theory says, in principle, for large countries, there is no constraint for financing for the government. If you look in, in standard textbooks here, this is main use principles of economics. There you see that government uh, finance leads to direct crowding out of private investors. And from this perspective, one would say, well, government finances are quite limited. You can see here these different approaches, the modern monetary theory approach saying no financial limitations. You have the classical approach saying, well, there's a very direct crowding out and the funds for the governments are very limited. Where does these different approaches come from? Well, it's a different modeling uh, of the economy, of the financial sphere of the economy. And one can say, well, the classical theory is a kind of real theory and modern monetary theory in its core is mainly a Keynesian monetary theory. So it's not really something different this modern monetary theory from standard Keynesian theory. Where do the differences come from? Well, in the classical theory, funds that are traded on financial markets is a kind of all-purpose good, for instance, corn, and this all-purpose good serves equally as a consumption good, as an investment good, and as a means of finance. And here, the core difference in monetary theories, the funds is money, are simply bank deposits. And of course, this different uh, approach to funds also has an implication how they are created. In the classical theory, funds are created by household savings. Households just decide not to consume the corn, and then it becomes available as funds. And in the monetary theory, the main difference is funds are, bank, are created by banks, uh, by bank loans, because funds are money and they can only be created by banks. And of course, the role of banks in these both approaches is different. In the classical theory, banks are simply the mediators for this all-purpose good. In the monetary theory, they create funds, 
And uh, it also has implications for the central bank, which is an important player in modern monetary theory. Uh, in the classical theory, the central bank is, is absent, you can say, because it cannot create funds, cannot create this all-purpose good. In monetary theory, uh, the central bank is the ultimate provider of money. And of course, this has then these very deep implications for government deficits. In the classical theory, government deficits simply absorb existing funds. So uh, financing is limited in the modern, in the monetary theory, in the modern monetary theory, the government uses newly created funds. The question is, what about, uh, the, what, what about the reality? Is it really true that there are no limitations for uh, governments to, to, to raise funds on the financial markets? I think we have one example uh, for large economies that are able to raise a huge amount of debt in their own currency. This is the debt financing of the United States and of the United Kingdom uh, in the First and Second World War. And you can see that in the United Kingdom, the debt to GDP ratio re reached the level of 250%. Uh, in the United States, it was more than 100%. But again, uh, you can see that public debt increased quite considerably uh, in the United States. And uh, as, as a result, but we but one can also see that this did not lead to uh, government insolvency or other, other major problems. The space for higher government debt can also be seen in the reaction of the G7 countries after the great financial crisis, where one could see that all countries increased their debt level by 20 or even more percentage points, again, without major problems, and in Japan, one can see that the debt to GDP ratio went up to 200, almost 240 percent. The critics of modern monetary theory, astonishingly, people like Larry Summers, Kenneth Rogoff, or Paul Krugman, which, which are Keynesians, um, uh, made the argument that um, high government deficits and high government debt leads to inflation and leads to currency crisis. And of course, in the extreme version, it's clear if you have excessive government deficits, this will also lead to negative implications. It's like when you talk about drinking wine or alcohol, if you drink excessively, it will have very negative consequences. But for this, you don't need very much scientific analysis. You have to find the right dose. And I think one can see that in the war financing, but also after uh, the great financial crisis, this right dose was realized so that, that, that the negative implications by the, that the critics of modern monetary theory raised did not materialize. One of the issues here is that excessive government deficit and debt leads to inflation. If you look at the data for the United Kingdom and the United States, in the First and Second World War, there were some periods where inflation was a little bit higher, but overall, one can see inflation did not get out of control. And in the case of Japan, you can see that uh, the debt level went up very much, but inflation was very low. In contrast, uh, Japan was almost always in a more deflationary terrain than in an inflationary terrain. And in my view, for the government financing of the damages of corona, the Japanese case is the more relevant case because the effect of corona on our economies is a deflationary effect. It's a huge decline in consumption. And if the government uses funds just to repair the balance sheets, to fill the gaps in private balance sheets, it just prevents an implosion of the economic system. And it's very unlikely that this would have any inflationary effect. When we, when we talk about MMT and the possibility of governments to raise huge amounts of money, there remains the problem of the euro area member states. As I said, MMT is a recipe for large economies who can raise debt in their own uh, currency and have their own central banks. And here for the euro area member states, we have the problem that their debt is de facto in a kind of foreign currency. So if Italy issues bonds, they are denominated in euro, and they do not have their own national central bank who can buy these bonds uh, if the private markets are not willing to purchase these bonds. The ECB, of course, has announced that it's willing to buy huge amounts uh, of government bonds. But of course, the ECB is limited to the capital keys. It has 
he said there will it will apply some flexibility but of course it we will not be able to fully purchase all italian gown bonds that might have to be purchased if private markets are not willing to buy more italian bonds germany is in a relatively good position it's a safe haven in the euro area, but Italy is very seriously affected by the crisis. And so I think one needs a, a common approach uh, in the eurozone to create the conditions that are required for modern monetary theory. Financing by the European stability mechanism is certainly useful. It's the first line of defense. But in the medium term, at least, I think we might need, will need corona bonds as an obvious solution for generating an adequate framework for MMT financing. So we need a joint and mutual liability for bonds in the euro area. And I think one can also convincingly explain why these corona bonds are different from euro bonds that were discussed in the period of the euro crisis. In the case of corona bonds, it's obvious that the financial needs are not due to policy failures of, of member states. And in addition, it's a one-time uh, event, and it's for new government lending. It's not for outstanding bonds, which was the idea of, of the Eurobond debate. So finally, what about helicopter money financed by MMT? I think in the shutdown period, I don't think it's a very good idea. It's not a very targeted form of support because many households do not require a, a financial support especially if they get money from unemployment insurance schemes or if they are employed by the government. And the support for balance sheet repair, which I think is really now very, very important, needs, needs much higher sums than the sums that are distributed under helicopter schemes. And in addition, during the shutdown, it's not a good idea to stimulate consumption by giving people money to spend. Therefore, in, during the shutdown period, I'm not sure whether helicopter money is the right thing to do. After the shutdown, of course, we need some support to restart the economy, to restart consumption. But here again, I think helicopter money is not a very targeted means because it's much better to support directly the sectors that have been suffering most from the shutdown, especially the social consumption. And here, uh, I think a reduction of indirect taxes might be more useful. So let me summarize it. I think MMT is good news in the war against Corona because it shows the government had the means to deal with the economic impact of this tsunami. They are able to contain the effects of the tsunami on the service and production sector to prevent the spreading of the, of the crisis to the real estate sector, to the banking system, and even to people holding money at banks. So I think this is a very, very good news. And as I said, there are no financial constraints for governments of, of large economies. I think the inflation risks are very low because what we are now facing is a large deflationary threat caused by the shutdown. One could also talk about the exchange rate risks. This is also something which is raised by the critics of MMT, but I think they are very limited if all countries, all major countries are increasing their debt at the same time. And finally, in my view, Corona bonds are the conditio sine qua non for establishing MMT conditions in the euro area. Thanks very much, Peter. That's very interesting. I, I was struck by the fact that the policies that you're talking about here are very much in the mainstream of thinking at the moment in how to deal with the crisis in Europe. But the people who are implementing these policies would not consider themselves adherents of MMT. Is this a kind of MMT by the back door? Well, it doesn't matter how you call it, but I think <laughs> there is obviously a willingness of governments now to incur large amounts of debt. Even in Germany, the Black Zero, which was a kind of holy grail uh, for our fiscal policy, is now abandoned. And so it doesn't matter how you call it. What matters is that governments realize they, are, they have no hard budget constraints, they can do what is needed to stabilize the economy in this kind of economic tsunami. As you know, the critics of MMT point to the risks of inflation when the economy picks up. Are you saying that at the moment those risks are so remote that we don't have to think about them? Yeah, as I said it, I think what, what we are now facing are deflationary risks. Think, think of the impressive decline of oil prices, and, and we know that, that oil prices have a very direct impact on inflation. 
I think overall we are facing deflationary risks and, and uh, this kind of energy approach will help to prevent deflation and I think it's quite unlikely that it will cause inflation. Has your thinking evolved after the last financial crisis or is this really how you've always thought about how we should finance crises like this? Well, I think especially in the German debate, there was always intensive discussion on limits for debt, for deficits. In dealing with this, I, I've realized, well, we do not have any sound evidence what is the adequate debt to GDP level. Even the 60% of the Maastricht Treaty is quite arbitrary, and the 90% by Reinhard and Rogoff also proved not very convincing. And so if you think along these lines, you will realize, well, there is much more leeway for public debt in dealing with such a situation. But of course, what, what is really important with this MMT, it depends on the diagnosis and on the dose. If you apply MMT in a situation where the economy is in an equilibrium, of course, it will have inflationary effects. But if applied in this kind of economic implosion, I don't think that there's any, any problem in using this instrument. Does this have implications for the independence of the European Central Bank? I think for the, for the European Central Bank, the best solution is if the euro area member states come out with a joint debt instrument, because in this case, the ECB has no problem in purchasing this uh, in, in really large, large quantities. For the ECB, it's much more difficult if we still have bonds issued by the national governments, and then there's a problem of the capital keys and, and the, the flexibility in purchasing bonds is, is, is limited. So for the ECB, definitely the best approach is, is kind of corona bonds. And, and then in this case, the ECB, as it has announced, is able also to purchase very large amounts of such an instrument. The descriptions of MMT from Ken Rogoff, Larry Summers, Paul Krugman, they were all made last year in a very different world. Do you think now that they will be revising some of their opinions in the light of what's going on in the world economy? Maybe one of the problems with MMT is just the wording. The question is, is it really modern? Or is mm. it just monetary theory, Keynesian theory, in some kind of new clothes? So much of the debate can be avoided if one just calls it monetary theory, Keynesian theory, as opposed to classical theory. And I think the basic idea of Keynesian theory is that we have a financial system that can create funds out of nothing that is not limited to saving decisions of households. I think this is the core idea. And whether you call it then modern monetary theory or monetary theory or Keynesian theory, as opposed to classical and real theory, I think that doesn't matter that much. Peter, thank you very much. That's all we've got time for. But uh, Peter, we'll have you back in a little while to see how this all turns out, if that's okay with you. Of course, yeah. At the Centre for Economic Policy Research, we've been covering this crisis in detail. Go to the COVID-19 section of VoxEU and you will find webinars, podcasts, articles. There's always something new every day. So we hope to see you soon. But for now, stay safe. And from the Centre for Economic Policy Research, goodbye.